Welcome to another edition, the last edition of 2018, Anglican Unscripted, episode 467. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm Gavin Ashenden, and as well as being New Year's Eve, it's the day when we remember with affection and gratitude the ministry of John Wycliffe, who was determined to bring the Bible to people so they could encounter Jesus as intimately as possible. Okay, welcome to a new show. Before we get started, I, oh, I've i lost my notes page. Hold on a second. Da, 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 da. You know, they think after all this time I'd have some experience <laughs> what I'm doing. Uh, no, I don't. <laughs> so if you're new, we, here's how it works. We have audience participation. And what we need you to do is like the show. Whether you see it on Facebook or you see it on YouTube, there's some place, there's a little thumb you click on the like. Uh, uh, YouTube has their own. Click there. If you've not subscribed yet, and uh, we're up to almost 4,000 subscribers, it's time to subscribe. And you click on the little subscribe button on the YouTube channel. And if you want to get instantly notified of a new uh, episode, you click on the bell and it will send you an email when there's a new episode out. Um, we also have a podcast. If you look in the YouTube show notes, you'll see a link to our uh, podcast. And best of all, we allow commenting. If you want to go to YouTube and have a conversation with other people who like or dislike the show or like or dislike our, our um, comments, it's time for you to add your voice to the show. And uh, it's a lot of fun to read through that. Uh, obviously, a lot of fan mail is in there. Uh, obviously, when we make a mistake, you're there to help point it out. And from time to time, George, Gavin, myself, and Alan may be a little off on our facts and... That's what you're for. Gavin, how are you doing? Well, never knowingly off on my facts, but <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but obviously we make mistakes. I make mistakes. Kevin, mm -hmm. I'm very well. I'm, how wonderful to have got to the end of this year <laughs> and be about to start another one. Although, to tell you the truth, I'm not very impressed with, with, with the concept of year as we have it. Um, I'm very moved by the, by the winter solstice when the days get longer and the light comes back on the 21st of December. And I'm very moved by Advent, the beginning of the Christian year. I don't find January the 31st terribly inspirational or moving. So for me, the two more cogent new years are are the, the astronomical, the geographical solstice one or the, or the Christian one. But I recognize lots of people think December the 31st matters and uh, so um, uh, happy new year. <laughs> yeah. Well, to, here, I mean, we about an hour and a half north of New York by train. Uh, new York City is a place where New Year's Eve people gather and crowd around Times Square and they want to watch a crystal ball drop uh, for 10 seconds at midnight. And there's a lot of buildup. All the TV stations covered. I'm sure it's covered a little bit by your BBC over there uh, at five, four in the morning. But um it is what it is. Uh, we we as a species love new, love starting over, like the second chance thing, um, and that's the cool thing of Christianity: the ability to to start over, to repent, and say, "I really screwed up. Tomorrow will be different." And uh, I, you know, I'd like to suggest a, a way of coming at the new year for people who are not natural party animals. I remember. Um, my, my father in God, uh, uh, an abbot of a monastery called Crawley Down, whose name was Father Gregory, who was one of the toughest warriors for Christ you could ever meet. And I just wished I'd known in my 30s and 40s what a wise, powerful Christian he was. But he, he said one or two things that have stayed with me forever. And one of the ones was that uh, as monks, one of the things they did was to enfold the darkness in prayer. So they would they would pray up to nightfall and then they go to bed. Then they get up in the middle of the night and they pierce the darkness with prayer. They go to bed and then they get up right at dawn and they they en en enfold the darkness with prayer. And he said, that's one of the most important things we do because we recognize that the darkness is not just a physical thing, but it's also, it stands for you know, that period of time when men, men and women come out and do things under the cover of, of darkness they wouldn't do in the daylight. Uh, and, and the response of Christians is not to party through the night. It's actually to hold it in prayer. So if you haven't decided what to do tonight, you might you might pray before you go to bed and then pray when you wake up and sandwich the darkness 
both of the of the night and also of the year with prayer because i think we're called to do that more than we're called to uh, to drink and dance i know i agree and I th another thing we do as a uh creatures of a uh, of a creator is we like to have resolutions Yes. You know, every every <laughs> December thirty first, uh, you you're either avoiding it or you're thinking about it, and uh, the popular ones are I'll, I'll lose weight, or I'll watch less TV, or I'll read more books, or I'll pray more. Um, for some of you, you can't be saying I'll go to church more because you already need to be going to church uh, every Sunday for worship, and that's a necessity. Um, but we have these resolutions we make up in our mind, and. If you're, just for, take a, a little example. Do you remember last year's resolutions? No. Because sometime in the second week of January, you forgot them, you avoided them, or you just broke them. And a uh, uh, good chance to ask you, Gavin, what are your new your year's resolutions? I think I'd, I'd like to change the question a bit, Kevin. Sure, <laughs> Always go ahead. when you don't have a good answer, change the question. <laughs> yes. I, I, I think what, I'd like to combine resolution with apprehension. What have, I, mm -hmm. what have I learned in this last year that I'd like to continue or to deepen? Because I think the difference is that New Year's resolutions are predicated on the idea we can make ourselves better, which is a form of Pelagianism. That's if you right. put apprehension... Okay. If you put apprehension to it, what have I apprehended? What can I continue? Then that's that's more Augustinian than Pelagius. And what it means is, Lord, what am I sorry for? And what do I need to improve for you and with you? I think the thing that's really struck me in this last year is prayer. I had no idea <laughs> uh, when I heard the whisper of the Spirit saying, um, put your sermons on the Internet. And by the way, also put morning prayer on the Internet. I had no idea what that would turn out to be. To my enormous surprise, I was sitting at home on midnight, uh, midnight, sorry, on Christmas Eve, um, and uh, I'm still not convinced about internet uh, Eucharists for a whole load of reasons. Um, but I felt very strongly the Lord was saying, "Yeah, you do midnight mass on the internet. Go, you know, just go and do it." Kevin, I had nearly 700 people uh, join in on that Facebook Live page, mm -hmm. and. Uh, I'm very hesitant to do this kind of things in case people see what a muddle I make of the altar, or uh, uh, or, or what an, what an inept what an inept sermon I give when I'm half asleep at, at eleven thirty at night. Um, one exposes oneself, but one should be willing to do that. I think what I've and also this morning when I resumed morning prayer after having lost my voice and uh, had my, my family with me, there were 150 people praying this morning. I, I think the thing I've learned is there is a power in doing the office. I've always known this, but doing the office out loud. Uh, one of my theological questions is, is there any oxygen in heaven? Because, because, and the reason for asking that is, it's only oxygen around one. the earth that allows singing and noise to carry. So mm -hmm. in terms of physics, we need this oxygen. Without oxygen, you can't sing or speak. It doesn't get heard. So how, I'm, I'm sure there's a, a scientist's answer to this. But I've become more and more aware that by speaking the gospel out loud, speaking our prayers out loud, doing the liturgy out loud, um, there is a, a power and a resonance to it um, that sitting down, doing it under your breath in a chair doesn't quite have. So this internet, these internet prayers are an extension of saying our prayers out loud um, and in some very strange way that I can only just intuit. It has a power and an authenticity, which is why I think the monastic communities gathered together. I think at their best, they were full of men and women who said, we'd like to spend quite a lot of our time praising the Lord out loud, holding the darkness at bay, filling the space around us with his name, with his praise, and with his love and to do this is to affect the world in ways we think we're sure about but can't measure and so i think for myself looking back over this last year uh, my sense of how important prayer out loud is liturgy praying together geographically or on the internet um, i need to go on doing it and i'm very grateful for the people who want to go on doing it with me and share that share that apprehension you know if you think about it uh, angels, and certainly a corporation in heaven, they have voice boxes and, and mouths, so you would certainly expect there to be some type of atmosphere 
You know, here we're eight parts nitrogen, two parts oxygen. You know, that's a good theological question. Yeah, you, you got my brain going. <laughs> well, in so. the book of Revelation, the, 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 you know, the angels and the saints are singing and praising all the time. And mm -hmm. one of the great gifts that the Orthodox Church has is when it, when it sits down to do its liturgy, it says, let's join in to what's already going on in heaven. That's the basis of Orthodox liturgy and worship. Sure. Uh, on, the, on the Protestant or the Western side, we tend to want to recreate it more on our own terms, which I think is something of a weakness. So I'm very much with the idea of the Orthodox saying, look, it's happening already. From the book of Revelation, we have a very good idea of some of the things they're saying and singing. So let's let's say and sing them too. Uh, and I, you know, if there isn't oxygen in heaven, there must be some other means of, um, be uh, means. <laughs> of, of carrying the, the joyous sound. <laughs> Well, all the Christian scientists out there are like, got something for gaming. <laughs> so that's what the comments are for. If you if you have the answer or have a good theology about atmosphere in heaven, just put it in the comments. It'd be kind of uh, fun to read. Um, you and I have talked about feminism, transgenderism, transgender baptisms uh, uh, many times over the last couple of years as you've been on the program. And I sent you an article this week, I think yesterday or the day before, about a new feminist Bible that was uh, written. And I said, this will be another great topic uh, to talk about <laughs> with Gavin. Uh, and But before we do that, we need to define things. And I, I, you know, feminism, if you ask a feminist, comes in waves or has, is defined by waves. The first wave was uh, suffrage. Uh, from 1849 to probably 1737 or 1930 and 1940 was women's suffrage. The first wave was looking for the right to vote. Um, the second wave was more of looking for equity, looking for um, a place in work, um, not being stuck at home, not being stuck as uh, just mothers and wives. Uh, the third wave, which is much more recent, probably in the, uh, the mid 2000s here, is much more liberal, much more uh, dangerous because it's involving the transgenderism, the LGTBY, everything else. Um, and it's just, it's gone completely wacko. So I just wanted to define these terms for you because we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, there's a new Bible out there, Gavin. I'm, I'm assuming you're going to get a copy. <laughs> well, I think it's a book on the Bible. It's called In Bible des Femmes, a woman's Bible. It's by two, by two authors. Uh, uh, I, I won't say, mad I don't know, what is MS in French? Because Madame and Mademoiselle, are it's probably Mouze, uh, Mouze <laughs> Savoie, <laughs> uh, and Elizabeth Parmentier have written this book mm -hmm. to redress ignorance over the texts. And um, what their sense of things is that um, uh, the, the sexists and patriarchs have misinterpreted the holy book and i i wonder who their sexists and patriarchs are uh, well, this is new this in, in response to me too can the bible be alive in the me too era I, 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 so two things first of all this has been done often before i remember reading my first one of my first feminist uh, interpretations of the bible was a celebration of eve in the book of genesis on the grounds that in terms of the character between Adam and Eve, Eve was the courageous person. Eve took the risks. Eve was fully alive. Adam just sat back there, did as he was told, and blamed people. And so um, that's not a bad reading. No, <laughs> I, I, can see, I can see why that, that would appeal to people. And I was, I was rather caught up with it, too. I thought, well, actually, I, I can see this. I think the great danger always, of course, is that we project our own, uh, our own penchant for the moment on biblical figures who can't answer back. Um, mm -hmm. But if we set that to one side, the real, th there are two problems with this work, though I haven't read it, with the concept that lies behind this work, which I'm more familiar with. The first is that all feminism, it, it, the currency of feminism is power. Well, it's power, but also it, it's justice. Um, and the problem with power is that it's extremely hard to interpret love using power. The great mystery that lies behind Pauline mysticism about the genders is mm -hmm. the fact that um, 
uh, there is a hierarchy and it's inverted. Jordan, Jordan Peterson's very good on hierarchies. He, he, in secular terms, he says, wherever you have values, you're going to have a hierarchy because you're always going to have, say, this is more, A is more important than B and we're going to put more, invest more into to A because it's so important. Uh, and then he quite rightly says that the danger with hierarchies uh, uh, and, and competence is that they become, uh, they, they become flawed and uncaring and the, the work of the left is to interact with the competent hierarchical part of society to, to pick up the casualties. Now, the, the, politically, that's a very good analysis. Of course, within Christianity, what we have is we have a hierarchy of love, not of power. Um, I don't think you could even say a hierarchy of competence because that, that brings a kind of functional sense to what theologians would call ontology. The fact is that God is just being. He doesn't need to function. Uh, he just is. But what you have in the hierarchy of the Holy Trinity is an inverted hierarchy where the, the humility and love is as valuable as uh, as power and majesty. I mean, that's the glorious thing about Christianity. And so you will always have power, majesty and responsibility, which is perhaps the father. And you will always have humility and service and even suffering, which, which is the son uh, and the spirit being the go-between who joins them together, one God. Now, um, how do you take love and interpret it using the language of power? You just can't. It's oil and water. It's hard enough for many people to understand the mystery that's within Christianity of this self-giving hierarchy defended by love. You can't do it if you're not a Christian, and you certainly can't do it if you're a feminist. And the reason you can't do it as a feminist is because you're bringing a prior value to uh, to, to your worldview, which is a, a filter which, which lets through power relations and blocks off other stuff. Now, if you examine Christianity in terms of power relations, you'll see a great deal of abuse because human beings are flawed. We abuse each other all the time. We speak badly of each other. Sometimes we throw our weight around when we shouldn't. Uh, we're, we're careless with one another. You, it's not hard to see the ways in which we fail, but we fail because we're sinners. Uh, some men are prone to fail physically. Uh, sometimes they're more sexually fallible and violently fallible. Some women, note I say some, not all, are prone to fail psychologically. Girls' schools contain a capacity for being horrible about each other in ways that are sophisticated beyond imagining to boys who just tend to lash out. So we have different ways of, of failing. But I think the answer to human failure is not to categorize it along gender terms, but to see it instead as the failure of, of humanity. The, the moment you categorize it in gender terms, particularly in terms of power, you then lose the mystery of self giving love. So my problem with the feminist Bible is that um, whilst they say feminism is not incompatible with Christianity, um, any philosophy based on power and the redistribution of power between different parties is not going to get the faith. Now, they, they say that um, we are aware in human history that um, some men have majored on wives submit to your husbands and have completely forgotten husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. This well, is true. It certainly <laughs> may be true, but that's not an argument against patriarchy. That's an argument no. for reading the Bible. And that's so, right. <laughs> and reading, all of, reading all of the Bible. They also say that, you know, Mary Magdalene has been described uh, as, as a, a fallen woman and a harlot, and she's been over-sexualized. Well, um, I dare say that some parts of the church have been uh, over-prone to overreact against sexualization. But actually, when you read the Bible, the Bible itself is, is very even-handed about, about gender. Mary is the most, Mary and John the, the Baptist, John the Baptist is, is hugely important, but, but you know, Mary is the theotokos, she is the bearer of, the, of, the, of Emmanuel. Mary Magdalene is one of the most influential and important disciples, and of course, has the encounter with the risen Christ. Now. There's nothing wrong with the Bible. Of course, there's everything wrong with our bringing our filters and our human uh, frailties, our, our psychological weaknesses. 
But, but that's not to say that Christianity is patriarchal or sexist. It is to say that, that it will be misinterpreted by people who are sexist, just as much as to say it will be misinterpreted by people who are feminists or who are socialists, people who deal in power relations or fascists, for goodness sake, people who deal in the primacy of ethnic groups. So there's no end to the way in which we can bring our limitations. But I, I think we have to, we have to have to do anything. I'd like to propose that, that feminism, whilst it may have done some useful things in bringing parity to human relations with unintended consequences, is not a filter you can use to understand the mystery, the mysterion of, uh, of the metaphysics of the, of, of the experience of the Holy Trinity. I think you're exactly right. Uh, as identified in Paul in Galatians, uh, he said there's neither Jew nor Greek, uh, there's no slave, there's no master, uh, there's no male or female. All are one in Christ Jesus. And that's God looking down. He sees one. He does no longer, there's no longer identity of your nationality, of your position, your politics, your gender. There's no identity except in Christ. And, uh, but when we look amongst each other, we still see these identities. We still filter and filter and filter. And we put uh, um, priorities on everything where uh, the priority of God is to draw you onto himself. The priority of man should be to worship God. That's, I, you know. I, I think that's right. But I'd like to make a qualification because it's not often made. Oh, um, please do. Yeah. <laughs> so, so no, I'm a lay you person, right. you're a bishop, so, <laughs> you can qualify of what I say any day you want. <laughs> so, if, if I can build on what you said and take it a bit further, um, mm -hmm. it, it certainly, you're quite right in saying that within, Paul tells us there are no subdivisions of category. And yet, at the same time, we find in Genesis that God made man male and female. Now, one of the oh, things sure. that some theologians say is uh, that, that, that e ethnic identity is along an enormously wide spectrum in which there is no bifurcation. You just, you know, it, 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 there, is no, there is no difference between black and white. There is no point where you end being black and start being white. There are well, well, gradations here, let, of let me clarify what I'm, I'm saying here, because, and it may help you. So if you find yourself a slave, you are to be the best Christian slave in the history of mankind. If you find yourself a master, you're to be the best Christian master in the history of mankind. If you find yourself a man, you're to be the best man, it, it, you know, Christian man. If you find yourself a female, you're to be the best Christian female. If you find yourself a Greek or a Jew, it's the same thing that applies. Okay, Wherever so, God so, finds so you. So this is true. The point you're making is yeah. that what the gospel does is redeem categories. And I agree with there that. There you go. But I'm, I'm making special pleading for male and female. And mm -hmm. I'm saying, so, so everything you said sure, is right. We build on that. Mm -hmm. And it's very important mm -hmm. indeed. Uh, but nonetheless, um, God, do, in Genesis, we don't say, we don't, we don't have him saying, I've made Jews and non-Jews. Uh, I've right. made slee and non-free. But we do have this very particular category of male and female. And now knowing how to be male and female is one of the great theological tasks we have that's completely different from any of the other categories you mentioned. Uh, and and there, it's no surprise in a way that it gets turned against us by spiritual malignity uh, and becomes a source of, of difficulty where it should be a blessing. So the, for example, um, the great problem between Adam and Eve is instead of being conjoined as male and female in the presence of God, uh, what the fall does is it brings antipathy between men and women. So now we ought to be on. We ought to be on the lookout. Anything that bring anything that adds fuel to the fire of antipathy between men and women, we ought to say spiritually, this looks like the work of the devil. <laughs> and therefore, one of the problems with feminism is that, that that it's predicated on on using the antipathy between men and women as a fuel. Now, it's a fuel to put things right in political terms. But as Christians, we don't believe or we shouldn't believe in putting things right as political terms. What do we have to do as Christians with this great division between male and female? The first is hold it and honor what God has given, which is why we think transgenderism is an attack on the categories God has given us to live in. And then do everything we can to find ways of making it benign men loving women, women loving men, so managing to relate together that we don't 
uh, that we managed to, 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 to quench this antipathy. My great problem with feminism and the secular politics that arise out of the Me Too movement is that they all build on heightening the antipathy. And somehow as Christians, one of the things I think we've got to do theologically and spiritually is, fi is find a language and a means of expressing the capacity for men and women to so know who they are uh, in God that we can make it easier and better for each other to be Christian men and Christian women, Christian fathers, Christian mothers. Uh, th th that's the task. And I really, I'm really afraid that I don't think feminism and sexual politics, including the Me Too movement, I don't think they help us spiritually. No, because they want to highlight our differences. Um, yeah. And, you know, we need to highlight what brings us together, and that's Christ. And, no, I agree with you that it's brought so much division, and it's kind of made the point now where, you know, slippery slope used to be a fallacy. You can't say slippery slope in any type of sentence because it doesn't make any sense, and it's just a fallacy, uh, and you're being silly. Well, we've seen this slippery slope over the last dozen years uh, with the uh, the gay culture, with the feminism culture, with the transgen now transgender culture. Um, it just there's just no end anymore, and it really Kevin, has I, become I, a slippery slope. I know slope. you're going to talk about this with George, and I don't want to tread on his on his on his ground. Sure. Uh, and he's, he'll say more sensible things than I can uh, if his past form is anything to go by. B but nonetheless, it, you sent me this picture of the Bishop of Toronto who is gay. Uh, marrying another man who is obviously gay and it being presided over by the suffragan bishop of Niagara, who, who is a woman. And I don't want to be personal, but if you look at their three faces, I, I looked at their faces and I thought, this is not holiness. This is, well, I don't want to say what it is because it, it, I, I'd like to leave people to make up their own minds, but I hope you might be able to put the picture up now or when you're talking with George. I'd, put it I'd just now. like to make... I'd like to make a theological point, and that is to say that um, uh, only uh, you could only have so the symbolism of a woman bishop presiding over the marriage of these two homosexual men synthesizes the slippery the end of the slippery slope argument. In other words, feminism has brought to the church a series of values that says equality is the most important thing. Now, if you decide that people's identity is defined by their sexual longing, which is what it is the moment you call yourself gay, then one of the things that feminism will bring to the calling yourself gay is to say, you must be treated equally to straight people. And that's that's why the ordination of women to the, to the priesthood and the consequent consecration of women to the episcopate leads inevitably to the greater celebration of gay marriage be because of the theological and philosophical categories that feminism carries with it. So I think it was perfect that they should have the woman Bishop of Niagara celebrate their marriage because it's exactly this alliance of feminism and homosexuality working together that has defined what the church is becoming. And my great argument against Justin Welby is not because I feel a degree of personal antipathy, but because we know perfectly, th this picture tells us what the Church of England is going to become. Uh, there is no way of stopping this progressive theological movement. The moment you accept feminism, the moment you accept equality, the moment you accept sexual identity as a Christian, you end up with the picture of the Bishop of Toronto marrying his homosexual partner uh, under the aegis of a woman bishop. Now, we have to decide, is this what Christ came to do for his church? And if so, why has it taken us 2,000 years? It can't just be the technology of the pill that has so shaken up our gender relations. And if it, you know, it, it can't possibly be that Jesus waited 2,000 years for the pill to be invented before he could launch his master plan of women bishops and, 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 and gay marriage. What instead we have in, in the New Testament is um, a different way of understanding uh, relationships between the genders and a very clear way of understanding what sin does to sexual appetites in terms of same-sex sexual relations. So those are our two narratives and I, I think I'm almost grateful, um, grateful is the wrong word, um, I, I, I see this, this, this photograph and this picture 
of being a very clear sign of of the perversion of the church. And one mm. of the things we're trying to do is not in a sexist or a, a reactionary or a chauvinist or a misogynist or a homophobic way. What we're trying to do is to purify the church. Apart from anything else, that image of the church it doesn't grow. It's it's withering on the vine. For all that its proponents say, oh, but look, it's going to attract anyone who wants justice and equity and parity and care for the marginalized and the you know protection for the minorities uh we will establish our so social credentials amongst people who are agnostic it hasn't had that effect uh and therefore i think that's a very good reason for going back to the scriptures and saying this is a progressive experiment theologically that has got it wrong and and spiritually just is bankrupt amen gavin i am going to tell us we've hit 30 minutes Oh, my word. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. It's, it, it was a, and by the way, this is a great show. People don't know this, but you and I sat down on December 24th and recorded a show. And mm -hmm. I had my Christmas cold. I was stuffed up. The throat was all full. I had a sore throat. I couldn't hear right. I kept hearing echoes and stuff like that. I hit all the wrong buttons, and we sat down for 20 minutes, and we recorded no audio. We have lots of video, and I don't know what happened. I just I wasn't feeling well. So this time we record, I, I double-checked and triple-checked and triple-double-checked that the audio is working and all the things here are bumping up and down. I'm going to take a quick picture just to show people what I see. Um, here's the picture picture. We're going to go a little over today. Um, if you see that little green thing on the side, that's the audio. And that's how I know I'm recording video and audio. And I just never looked the other day. It's, it is what it is. So we've hit 30 minutes. That's enough. Now, I'm get recommending a New Year's resolution for all of our viewers. Watch more Unscripted. You, you, can't, go, you can't go wrong there. Lose some weight. <clears throat> Pray more. Pray the daily office. You can't go wrong there at all. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm Gavin Ashton, and you've been listening very patiently to episode 467 of Anglican Unscripted at the turn of the secular year. Mm -hmm.